welcome back to the Turn by Turn podcast, trainers. I am your host, Alex, and I am joined again today by my great friend, Daniel. For the sake of this episode, I will be Professor Daniel. <laughs> ah, I like it, I like it. Or maybe it'd be Professor Magar, I guess, but Professor Daniel works for this episode. Uh, really, it should be Professor something that is a tree, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've taken all the good trees at this point. Ah, very possibly. Uh, Today, though, we are doing, for our season finale of Season 1, a game that I think we both, or I guess it's a series of games that we both have a lot of connection to, and that is Pokemon Gen 3. Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. Woo! So (laughs) I think think the, the important choice, or important question to start with is, what version did you pick i picked ruby and i remember buying this like the second it hit the shelves yeah uh i was able to convince my parents to let me play pokemon very shortly after ruby came out um so i ended up getting ruby as well but that was not enough for me i was super into it so this kid at my church like a year later had sapphire and he didn't want it anymore and he was like yeah i'll sell it to you for like 20 bucks or something or 10 bucks it was really cheap so i bought sapphire from him and then bought emerald when it came out i think Mm -hmm. i was really into this era yeah i played emerald much later but i've never played sapphire oh it's so much different than ruby like is it no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not at all. For some reason I like totally bought that despite knowing the history of these things. Huh. I guess I'm feeling gullible today. <laughs> uh so what started did you pick first and then we can do which one do you prefer today? All right. So I started with Torchic. I um generally when I start Pokemon games I'll start with the fire one. So started Torchic. I started with Trico. Okay. I like I, lizards. I'm not sure if I played through with Trico. It was always Torchic or Mudkip. Mm, I see. Mm. Uh, I think I prefer Blaziken these days. I was never a big fan of Sceptile, even though I think Trico is the coolest of the three starters. Um, when you get them to their final forms, like Sceptile just is not as cool as Blaziken. Um Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I don't even... what Mudkips is like Marsh Stomp, right? Yep. Yeah, uh, also not nearly as cool. Oh, I, I agree. But I, upon further replays of Ruby, I would gravitate towards Mudkip. Okay. So I, I would always start Fire, but then upon the replay, I would... I would use Mudkip, and I liked Mudkip quite a bit. Oh yeah, I'm I'm just saying compared to like Gen three, I think in, if you're gonna look at overall starters um, for the entire franchise, I think Gen three has all three of them are some of the strongest starters in terms of design that we've ever had. Ooh, interesting. I don't I don't know if I'd agree with you. I think I'd um, in. This might be super biased and mostly based on nostalgia, but I think the the original three are my favorite. Mm, yeah, I, I think the original three I like more too, but I'm just saying like overall, if I was going to rank all of them, I think that all of Gen 3 would do pretty well. Oh, okay, that that's totally fair. I would agree, I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that they're totally my favorites. I really liked uh, Gen 2 starters as well, but there's some later. Um, and I don't think it is just nostalgia for me either, because we get to, like, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to misspeak. I think it's Gen 5. Let me, let me glance just so. Yeah, I didn't like any of the starters for Gen 5. I know I might be weird for that. And I think I even had that moment of, like, oh, no, like, Am I getting old? Is the magic wearing off? And then Gen 6 came out, and I was like, no, I like these. <laughs> um, at least I, li- I didn't like the grass one, but I liked uh, Froki and Finnick- Finnegan, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, okay, no, it's not just nostalgia. Like, 
And then Gen 7, I like... Uh, I, I'm worse on the names. What are they called? I liked Rowlet and Lytton in Gen 7. Mm-hmm. So, it's just Gen 5. I, th- I thought it was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that Gen 3 is also maybe the only one other than Gen 1 that I really like all of them. I I kind of like uh, Chikorita, but I know that's more nostalgia, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, But yeah, I think like, so I like all of Gen 1, 2, and 3's starters. And then Gen 4, there's one. Gen 5, I don't like any. Gen 6, there's one I don't like. 7, there's one I don't like. 8. Eh, I'm less into the uh, the monkey for the newest gen. Grookey? Yeah, I, I don't like him as much as the other two. No? I love no. Grookey. Grookey uh, reminds me of my Pomeranian. She, yeah. uh, she really loves her toys. And like will hide them under the couch and stuff. And it kind of reminds me of how Grookey has his little stick. I see. But uh, I would imagine a fair amount of people don't have that ex- same experience. <laughs> yeah, that's that's part of what I've always loved about Pokemon, though, is that we all have our favorites, and each one um, kind of speaks to us differently. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just looking at... Uh, I watch the YouTube channel sometimes... Um, Oh, goodness. I gotta look at my history now, because I, of course, can't remember the second I need to. I was watching it, like, last night, so I shouldn't have to go back far, but of course I was also listening to music. There we go. Um, I watch the YouTube channel sometimes, Loxton and Noggin, who is sort of like game theory, um, and he was doing a review, which he fully admits uh, is so he can have the tax write-off. Um, of the Pokemon series of plushes that they recently did, that they they made one for literally every Pokemon. Oh, really? Every single one has their own plush, uh, which is just insane. But I, I love that because there's you know some people that just don't get merch for their favorites. I know it's it's like the Funko Pops where there's now like the Funko Pops of like literally everything. Yeah, you would think, but like, I, I'm not super into the Funko Pop thing, but I, I would be interested in some of the things I like that have no merch, and they haven't gotten to those things yet, so. <laughs> I don't know, we'll see if they do. But anyway, back to Pokemon Gen 3. Uh, so the reason that I, I am so nostalgic for this generation, and I fully admit that, is not just that it was one of my first, but it's, I guess, the how nostalgia works. I just have tons of great experiences around these games. Um, my best friend at the time, his name was Drew. And I would go over to his house and we would do lots of sleepovers and stay up all night playing um, Pokemon Gen 3 and just seeing what we could find, um, playing through the games, uh, fighting each other. I eventually got an action replay um, which I've talked about in a previous episode. And that was really cool. We would use it to um, give ourselves all sorts of Pokemon because I could control what Pokemon spawned in the bushes and I could make it literally anything. Um, So we would do that. We did different challenge runs. um, And I thought that was really fun, like starting the game over and I can use the action replay to control what your starters are. So I could make you start with things you weren't supposed to start with, you know. Um, so, like, could you beat the game if you started with Geodude instead of one of your starters, you know? And then it was just these really cool things we can do with uh, emulators now. But back in the day, I thought that was so neat that I could just do that. Yeah, I never had one of those, so I would always have to do the the playthroughs. But I, I didn't mind, because it, it feels like... um. Gen 3 is just such a um, step up from Gen 2. Not slamming Gen 2 at all mm-hmm. or, or any of the history, but like art style wise, gameplay wise, they really, really, really like took a big step as far yeah. as the series goes. 
I, I don't think I had played Gen 2. Uh, I don't think I'd, I'd gotten it yet by the time I had Gen 3. So I didn't even have that as a reference point. But I just remember thinking it really gave me a sense of scale. And I was like, I just can't believe they fit this entire thing onto a cartridge this size because it's such a huge adventure. It's so massive compared to um, silver or gold. I'm not sure about that because of silver and gold having two different regions. Oh, oh, not not as far as like physical map, just like oh, okay. as far as like playable content, I guess. Yeah, I, I get what you mean. So like there's planting berries. There's all these other secret bases, secret bases in the woods and you can decorate them. And there's breeding was more of a thing. Yeah, the breeding started. There was the the mixing the berries to raise the different like personality traits and things. Uh, making poffins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Pokemon contests. I think yeah. that was the thing, right? I think if I remember right, and this is a super vague memory, wasn't there like a beauty pageant or something you could? Yeah, remember? that's what that's what the contest was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could use your different moves, and they had new effects. So they were like new viable move sets because they did things in contest. Um, and that would get your Pokemon ribbons. And you could, I, which I, I don't think did much for you, but you could show them off on the Pokemon stat page. Yep. <laughs> so it just feels like such a colossal step forward compared to the other, the other ones. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you have uh, some favorites from Gen 3? Yes. Um, I'm struggling to remember the names of them, so I'll do my best. I remember... Um, I thought the story, and maybe we can get into the legendaries more later. Yes. Because like, I bet you have a lot of thoughts on them. But the Reggies always felt very, very cool to me. Mm. And... The process of like getting to like even do, like potentially catch them. Yeah, uh, the Reggies are very cool, just conceptually. Mm -hmm. And like the idea of kind of like old like robot type things, and the different different ways they manifest, which was very very different than the other games. Yeah, I think there was a lot of that in Gen Three for weird new Pokemon things like um, I'm looking at the full list and you have Pokemon like cast form that can change his form based on the weather. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really fascinating. And then there's also um, Shedinja is another super weird one. Do you remember how you get Shedinja? I don't. You get a Ninkata, I think it's called. It's this little bug Pokemon. Mm -hmm. And it evolves into Ninjask. And if you have a spare slot in your party, when it evolves into Ninjask, you also get a Shedinja. Huh. Oh, so I, I think I do remember that a little bit. Now it's just you're... one of those things that, like, I would never... I, I always pretty much kept a party of six. So I had no idea. But I saw this little 1 HP Pokemon around. Um, because that's Shedinja's thing. You can, he has one health, and it can only be damaged by super effective things. Which I think is super cool design. Like, I would have never found that without a friend tipping me off and being like, yeah, I think you should evolve a Ninkata when you have extra slots in your party. And I'm like, why would I do that? But okay. And then it's blowing me away that you get a whole other Pokemon. And I can't name too many others um, that do things like that. The, the mythology of like how Pokemon came to be and are like expanded a lot. Yeah, I would agree with that. Which is another thing that makes it super exciting as far as the gateway to the next game. Mm -hmm. um, I also, just some of my favorites, just to go over some of them, I thought the mm -hmm. Aeron line was really great, uh, ending in Agron, even though I don't think they're very good or viable, uh, like, with stat-wise. Yeah. Um, Wismer, I thought was really cool with x -Bloud. My favorite color is purple, so that, you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, Flygon, everybody loves Flygon. 
great design there. Yeah, and I'm just going non-legendaries right now. Oh, yeah, fine. Uh, Shedinja, just a really weird Pokemon. I think it's super cool. His little halo is great. Um, Again, in Loving Purple, uh, I like Sableye, of course. Oh, yeah. What is that one called? The little, the one that's red and he has the claws. Why am I struggling on him now? The crab? No. Here we go. I found a list that has their names. It was, he's only in one version. And the other version, I forget what you get. Oh, okay. Yeah, the other version you get Saviper. Yeah, he's like a really weird one. Yeah, I think he. I thought he was so cool though. I like Both. the gar the the garlic head guy. I can't remember his name right now. Garlic head. Like he's basically just like a garlic clove. Oh, uh, metatite. Yeah, metatite. Sorry. Even though it's not, it it doesn't really even really look that much like garlic. It just kind of makes me think of it because it go. It's the little white bulb that kind of goes up to the point. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he was always a fun one. I liked the Ralts line. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that that was a fun line because it kind of mirrored the Abra line. Um, I know I'm naming a lot, but I just like a lot of these. Um, I liked Skitty. I didn't like Delcaddy as much, but Skitty was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of same with Vigoroth. I liked Vigoroth, but not so much Slack Off or Slacking. Yeah. But it was cool that to me that this slack off that this this kind of useless Pokemon sort of like Magikarp could evolve into something better that was more usable. Mm hmm. Uh, Lunatone and Solrock were pretty cool design ones. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Styles I'm, I'm still going. Cast form Kecleon is another weird one that mm-hmm. works in a way that we've never seen that whatever he got hit by, that's the type he would become. Yeah. So that was just another. It, it felt like there were lots of new ways to play the game. The the dragon line, the the baggin line was really cool. Mm-hmm. Absol Absol is still a great design. Um, I think that's it until legendaries. Uh, and then of course the starters are are great. And I have a, a an even greater attachment to this one because I also with Gen three we got Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness which was a whole standalone adventure on the GameCube. And uh, one of the Pokemon I got in that was Shift Tree. <clears throat> I think it was actually a C dot when I got it, but basically my starter for that game, uh, I-, I got him pretty quick into the game, and then Shift Tree was just my buddy Pokemon for that game. So mm-hmm. I-, I definitely have a little bit of an attachment to Shift Tree, and Ludicolo is also just great. <laughs> uh, what were you going to say, though? Uh, the one thing I wasn't a big fan of as far as like the new the new set for this series was I thought the fossils were kind of weak. Yeah, uh, for sure. Pretty, pretty boring in comparison to some of the other ones. Yeah, because I remember like re- really s- stressing over those choices. I just realized, too, or they, was this this era? Is this the era we got Natu and J- Zatu? No, this was Mentang and... When did Natu and Zatu come out? I don't remember. Uh, one of the ones I haven't played because I'm not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> In that... So there was... Anor... Anor? I- I'm talking about a different one, sorry. Uh, let me let me glance real quick at when he came in. Was he Gen 2? I don't think so. Yes. Yeah, he was Gen 2. It's okay. the little green bird that's a little ball. Oh, okay. I was going to say he was great, but he's not the Sarah. Um, yeah, Lily and Anorith and all that. Sorry, I, I totally like just deviated a second ago. <laughs> um, yeah, I always stressed over like which fossil choice to pick. And so I was always one of those that would look it up in advance. And so when I looked it up, I was like, I don't feel like uh, there is a right choice, so mm-hmm. I didn't like design for either. Um, I think I prefer Anorith by that much. Yep, I would agree. Just because the other Mentang isn't isn't really anything like well, it's Ma- not... Mentang is a different thing. That's not the other fossil. 
No, the fossils are Lilip and Anerith. I, I learn something new every day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't super... If if you look at the list I, I sent you, you can see both of them. And Gotcha. Yeah. I, I just don't really like either. They're just kind of kind of boring. Yeah. But it doesn't even matter because there's just so many others that, that fill in the hole of a, a couple of less interesting ones aren't a big deal. <laughs> For sure. And there's some that I think their design is less interesting, but the lore around them is better. Like um, Relicanth. Because I didn't think Relicanth... I, I still don't think Relicanth has a great design, but... I remember you could like only find him using the dive HM and he was like super deep down and super hard to find. And I was just like, Ooh, it, he looks kind of like this ancient fish. Um, I think that's really cool. So I just have fond memories of looking for him. Mm -hmm. So lots, uh... lots of fond memories of those sorts of things. God, it's probably awful. I'm not even going to look up the name because I would be probably too embarrassed. But uh, in my middle, I, this came out when I was in middle school years to like date myself a little bit. Um, elementary and middle school, I mm -hmm. think. Right. That that sounds right. But I ended up reading a web comic for a while, too, that I'm sh it was like wildly inappropriate for my age. Um but it was uh, like some comedy thing about Gen 3 and they used sprite art from Gen 3 to make the whole thing. And like I said, I wouldn't I don't know that I'd stand by that today. But at the time, I thought it was funny as like an immature middle schooler. You know, I, I was watching the show. I read this web comic. I played the games like it just kind of spanned everything. So how about we go to talk about the legendaries a little bit so we sort of touched on the reggies was there which one was your favorite so reggie rock reggie ice and reggie steel uh i think reggie ice is my favorite i would probably lean reggie ice too not i guess i don't have a super strong reason other than maybe design but i remember having very warm feelings about finding finding out they exist in the the quest to find where they're located was always something that sticks warmly in my mind. Yeah, I don't have that much of an attachment to them, um, really. Though I do remember, um, I think it was like in the DS era, I ended up tr trading on the Global Trade Network a good bit. And uh, you, one of the things you could do was random trades. You offer up something and then somebody randomly trade you for it um or you could uh offer up something and then say specifically what you wanted and i remember i ended up with the shiny reggie rock and i thought that was super cool um but then i traded him for something i can't remember what but it was something in like the real world like some other whole game or something that somebody <laughs> gave me for my shiny reggie rock so i was like wow all right wow that's really fascinating. I never would have thought to like trade a Pokemon in game for something in the actual real world. Uh, I didn't either, but he huh. wanted it real bad. <laughs> I guess so. Um, did either of the legendary birds for for this stick out? Uh, I, define bird. Um, so Latios and Latios. Um, yeah, I liked both of them. Um, the movie around them I thought was really good too, which definitely helped. I haven't um, seen the movie, so maybe that I don't really have super fond memories of them just because um it just it didn't feel that unique compared to some of the other like legendary choices. Yeah, Pokemon Heroes is that one. Mm -hmm. Um I remember too. My my friend, the the friend I mentioned earlier, um, Drew was one of those. Uh, my my uncle works at Nintendo Kids. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he told me some weird stuff before, like the Shedinja thing that totally panned out. Um, but he I, I he totally tried to convince me that like there was some um, way that like you could 
uh, like get Latios and Latias to have an egg together, and then it would be like this fusion Pokemon. And I was I, I tried to do that for so long, and of course was never able to do it because that's not a thing. <laughs> but it's kind of a cool idea, though. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that like it was green. I think I had a dream about it at one point. <laughs> And I don't know why I remember that, but they were like green or something. <laughs> um, the thing that they made. It was really weird, but I was definitely obsessed with it for a little while as a kid. With with color blending, you'd have to be purple. <laughs> See, I don't. <laughs> then maybe I, I it makes even more sense. <laughs> um, you didn't care for them that much, though. Uh, they just didn't really stick out to me. They felt very similar to Lugia from the previous game. So it didn't feel like extra cool to get one of them because it felt like I had already kind of gotten something along the lines of that. Whereas like like Groudon or Kyrogre or like the Regis or even Rayquaza all felt very different. Yeah. So, um, and maybe maybe I like them more because I didn't have Gen 2 first. Yeah, that could be. Like so they're I, not horrible yeah. characters or anything they just didn't didn't stick out strongly to me uh yeah i can see that um one just to jump back a little bit to uh waylord is another one that i felt like expanded the pokemon universe because that is the biggest pokemon today i think still oh really that's cool yeah in terms of just size um and i remember playing pokemon battle revolution on the wii which had a decent uh si sca sense of scale and seeing Waylord, when you send out Waylord, it was just always insane, like, visually. Mm -hmm. I know that um, Alex has played far more Pokemon games than I have, but one of the things that really stuck out to me when playing Pokemon Sword was that um, you get to see the scope of the size a lot more than in any of the other games. So in sword when you see whalemer he's like way way bigger than like all the other pokemon what whale lord you said whalemer oh that's just what i remember seeing in sword oh okay um yeah i don't remember how big whalemer is actually he's a lot bigger in sword than i gotcha than, than a lot of the other pokemon which was sort of the the gist of it you sort of think about them as similar sizes but in reality, they can be huge. Yeah, I remember uh, Glalie was one of those that people were like, oh, how big is he? Like, probably a beach ball or something. But like, no, he's like as tall as a human. And it's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, to jump back to legendaries, though, let's keep going down the list. Kyogre and Groudon, how do you feel about them? Uh, so I never, I think I only got to play as Kyroger like once or twice at a friend's house who had Sapphire. So I don't have too much of an opinion on him, but I really like Groudon. I remember um, when you, you catch him, he was, he instantly became like my second strongest Pokemon after Blaziken. Blaziken. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it felt good going into like the second second part of the game with like two really strong Pokemon since I had focused on him focused on basically just the one. So I had one super strong one and then like a couple of like mediums. Yeah, so for sure. It was cool to get such a strong Pokemon that far into the game because normally. Obviously, the legendaries are different, but catching things in the wild, they tend to like top out at like level 25 or so. Yeah, and, and it's definitely different to uh, oh, getting something at level 50 was super useful. Yeah, and it always made it feel serious. Because he, he has a very like menacing expression, very tough, very cool. What did you think of them? Uh, I think they're both really awesome. Um, I prefer Groudon to Kyogre, but I mean, both of them are just super cool. I just remember, you know, when you first meet Groudon and uh, he's sitting in all the lava stuff, like 
it just looks so cool. Mm-hmm. And it, it, just again, the the set piece and the, the lore and the story around it, I think, is a lot more neat than the actual Pokemon. And I think that they do a good job building up the lore that it feels like a big deal when you finally get to encounter Groudon. In my case, I only know Groudon, but yeah, I agree. Like it means so much more than some of the other legendaries and the other games that are a little vaguer. Yeah, that kind of just come out of nowhere. Yeah, you sort of the TV show sort of fills in the details of the legendaries for the other two generations. Yeah, to go into the plot a little bit, um, you have Team Magma and Team Aqua. For those of you who are not familiar um, that want to um, have their thing take over the Earth, pretty much like Team Aqua wants the entire world to be water. Um, And Team Magma wants the whole world to be land, I guess. Um, Both of which would be disastrous for obvious reasons. But uh, they both like keep hyping up that they're going to use this legendary Pokemon to do that. And so you feel like I felt like there were good stakes. Um, And it really made sense why we needed to. And uh, any thoughts on Rayquaza? Um. He's also super cool. I remember, uh, I don't remember the, the names of many of the areas, but I remember Rayquaza, you catch it, Sky Pillar. And that always just sounded so cool, lore-wise. Um, um, yeah, I mean, how do you feel about him? I remember having such a hard time catching him. Mm-hmm. Like, being so frustrated, because he's so powerful that he would just wipe out like he could one hit a lot of my my other Pokemon. So I remember having to work really hard to get him. But definitely worth it. Yeah. And uh, I think he's like level 70 or something. So it was super <laughs> serious when you find him. Um, we didn't talk about it too. But Latios and Latias, did you like how you caught them? Not remembering how you catch them. Um, you, after you beat the game, you if you watch TV... At your mom's house. Um, it says like there's a news report about a blue or red Pokemon, depending on your version, um, uh, that's been f- seen around the Hoenn region. And uh, you need to try and find it. And so it's kind of random where it ends up. And I forget how you track it down, but there is a way to. I don't, I don't remember the method I used. It's been too many years. But then uh, it just tries to run away from you and you have to keep trying to track it down. And so you end up the the method I know once you find it is to use like Wobbuffet, which you doesn't allow you to run. Mm-hmm. So you can as long as you have a Wobbuffet out, you can be throwing Pokeballs. Yeah, I don't really have a strong memory of that. Mm, I thought it was neat just because it's another of those like this works different than what I'm used to. Which I think adds to the game and makes it more fun that there's the ever changing mechanics. But it never seems too unfamiliar. Like it's all you know, you can grasp very quickly what you're supposed to do. Definitely. If it, it follows the, the format without, but not boringly. So like it adds new mechanics that make it fun despite the familiarity. All right. How about we pop to a quick break and we'll come back and talk even more about it. That sounds good to me. All right. Bye. One heist, six plots for betrayal. When Raya Cautella cons five other thieves into helping her steal a magical artifact from the most powerful man in the world, she knows she's playing with fire. What she doesn't know is that the rest of her crew is just as underhanded as she is, and they all have plans of their own. MJ Kuhn's Among Thieves, a fantasy heist novel full of twists, turns, and betrayal, available beginning September 7th wherever books are sold. Visit mjkuhn.com for more details. 
Hi there, I'm David. And I'm Kate. And we're the hosts of another Zelda podcast. There are so many good podcasts out there, and some of them in particular concern the Legend of Zelda. <laughs> That's right, Kate, and we are another one of them. we That is actually the name of our show, Another yes. Zelda Podcast. And in our show in particular, we talk about some of our favorite dungeons, characters, boss battles. We have top ten lists. Yeah, we do deep dives on game design and production aspects of the different Zelda games. And we talk about our own experiences. We do some review episodes, talk about our challenges, our struggles, and our victories. That's right. You know, really just almost anything that has to do with Zelda, we like to talk about it. A new episode comes out every other Friday, and you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and YouTube. And you can also check out our episodes on our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com. That's right. All right, we will see you there. Okay, bye! We are back from our break, and now Alex is going to educate me on Jirachi, which isn't a character from Happy Days for for our very older listeners, and <sighs> Deoxys. Uh, I mean, I can't educate you on them too much. Um, the reason <laughs> that I got them was because I had the action replay and I could spawn whatever I wanted. I remember thinking that Deoxys is like a space Pokemon, and... I remember in Ruby and Sapphire, there is a spaceport and you go talk to them and they're like, all right, we're, we're leaving soon. We're prepping our ship. And I kept wondering, um, yeah, it says it's Moss Deep Space Center. And I just always kept wondering, like, how do I make them take off? What do I do? Um, and the answer is you can't. But that is always how I thought you solved that. And I think my friend that... Mr. Uncle works at Nintendo that that was not true at all. He probably told me that like, no, that that is how it works and you got to do that at some at some point. I don't know. Um, but I also really like their their designs for both Jirachi and Deoxys and uh, Deoxys actually has multiple forms he can be in where he gets a stat boost uh, based on what form you put him in. And he has like speed, attack, defense, Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought those were it, it's more of that changing how the game is played it is another just really cool one yeah I really like his design I wish I would have had the capacity to get him maybe I'll even go back and get him <laughs> yeah um, it's definitely making me want to play the remake at least uh, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire yeah it looks fantastic Very, very cool very sleek design um, I looked up to the differences for Emerald, and I remembered some of them. Um, the one I remembered was uh, Latios and Latias. I was like, which one do I catch? I really wondered that the whole time I was playing it. And so at the end of the game, it says a bird, and it's like static Pokemon. So it says like a uh, Pokemon is sighted over the blank region. Uh, try and look for it. I think it's like in your head or something. It's like you didn't quite catch what the what color the announcer on the TV said. Um, what color do you think it was? And it says red or blue. And then that determined which one you got. Yeah. Um, and it says too. I didn't know this, but it says the one that is not selected is available to catch if you get an Eon ticket, which is an event item, I think, and you travel to the Southern Island. The one you don't get will be there. Um. Some other differences. The sprites are different. Emerald, instead of Ruby, unlike Ruby and Sapphire, has animated sprites um, that just when you send your Pokemon out, they do a little animation. I thought that was cool. It says Team Magma and Team Aqua's hideouts are now open after you defeat a certain gym leader and are moved. Um, both Groudon and Kyogre can be caught. Uh, only one will appear at a time, but once the player's caught or defeated one, the other can be caught or defeated as well. Um, Emerald has more double battles. Um, gym leaders can be re-challenged after you beat the main story, and they will do double battles, which I think is really cool. That is pretty cool. That's uh, almost mirrors what we had talked about in our like future Franchise Hopes episode, where we were talking about how... Um, it'd be cool if they integrated the gym leaders more into into the story or even like giving you the capacity to be a gym leader. I also wanted to talk about a little bit um, just something that really stuck out to me. Um, 
in and something I'm worried about the future of the franchise for Pokemon. Because with uh, Sword and Shield, we just have DLC, which to me is just really not exciting at all. Um, and this is another of those that it's like, is it more pro-consumer on paper? Yeah, it is. Um, I, I don't know that any other franchise could get away with it, but the third version in Pokemon is just something that I think is a staple. Um, and when you really like a game you don't mind playing through it again. You kind of want to. And so it was just really cool with how much I loved Ruby and Sapphire when I eventually got Emerald and the sprites moved and certain areas were designed a little bit differently and Team Aqua and Team Magma were doing different things um, and the story's a little bit different. It was all just really cool and I was really excited to go through the, the whole game again to figure out what all the differences were going to be. Um, and I just, it would, I think it'd be a really big shame if we just did DLC from here on out um, in place of a third version. Mm -hmm. And I know that to, to piggyback off that a little bit, um, cause it's not an episode unless we reference fire emblem, but um, in fire emblem three houses, aside from the DLC, which changes the game a little bit, the multiple playthroughs aren't a bother because I'm having fun trying different things. And it's similar with the third version that they'll put out of the Pokemon games. Like if you're having fun, you're not going to mind like playing through the, like the base story again, because you're getting fun. Other little things each time you play. Yeah. And then there's also just the preservationist in me. Um, I, I'm sure I've talked about it on the show before. I'm really big into preservation of media and that means movies, music, uh, books, but also games. And it's really great that, you know, 10 years later, if I want to play the super version of gen three, I can just buy a copy of Pokemon Emerald. I still have my copy though, because of course I do. If, if somebody new wanted to, if, if I, you know, if a kid wanted to, um, they could just buy R Emerald and have that. And I worry that in 10, 15 years, um, and I do think Pokemon will be relevant in 10 or 15 years, and even though it's it, I, w I would want this anyway, even if it wasn't. But I think Pokemon especially, you have lots of reason to go back and play the old games. But if somebody wanted to play the super version of Sword and Shield, I'm not sure that the Switch's uh, eShop is going to be online still. They they can find a copy of Sword and Shield, I have no doubt, because the, the cartridges will still be around. But I'm not sure that you're going to be able to buy that DLC in the future. That is sad. But maybe they'll come out with a definitive... Well, not definitive, but... Like the master version of Sword and Shield. It wouldn't be exactly the same... But Game Freak seems to be kind of good about this with things like Heart Gold and Soul Silver and Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, like making these uh, every so often making these generation games um, accessible again. And it's fine to me that it's not exactly the same, um, but just the ability to go back and revisit that generation, I think, is really great. So that's just some of my worries for the future. Let's see, what else did I write down to talk about for this generation? Oh, yeah, the music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what did you think about the music? I'll, I'll let you start on that one. I really liked the music. Um, I'm basically a sucker for all of the Pokemon music, so... I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Like, Pokemon, it's, it's, it's existence just... means it is good. <laughs> Yeah, Pokemon's music has just always been really, really good. Um, and definitely there's some that are better than others, but I mean, I, I would never point to a game, a, a soundtrack from Pokemon and be like, yeah, that one was just bad. Because <laughs> uh, it plays the favorites, but it also like introduces new stuff each time. I can't remember a lot of the... It, it's been too long for me to remember a lot of the specific songs. But... I it's one of those that like I'd know it when I heard it. Um, if you played me like any song, even if it's one I hadn't heard, 
I might go, ah, did this leak from the new Pokemon game? Is this the new battle theme? Like, it has a very distinct sound to it. Um, and and I, I love all of them. And just the, again, the nostalgia. Uh, the nostalgia of booting up. Um, it's, it's actually what I did to get myself in the mood for this episode. Right before we started, I, I pulled up the uh, intros. And I watched the intros for Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. All three of them. And it just takes you back, you know? It's it's just really exciting still. Um, I just, I can still remember that excitement of when the title screen hits and you see Groudon and it's this red, like, lava stuff washing over the title screen. I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, I am ready for it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> We talked about in the last episode we recorded uh, Advance Wars. Um, we talked about Famicom Wars, and I pointed out the uh, the guy on the cover, the the black man that is just super ready. That that is me. <laughs> that face he's making. That's me when it's uh, when I see the title screen for <laughs> Gen Three. And man, it. If you want an in-depth RPG podcast, we are making references to the cover of Super Famicom Wars. I don't know if you can find anything more niche than this. Yes. So. For the Satella <laughs> view. Yes. Our other frequent reference on our podcast. So it all of this talking is making me wonder, is this your favorite? My favorite of the Pokemons? Yes, would you call this your... It, it's obviously going to be pretty close. I know, but like, would you put this on the top of your Pokemon tier? Is this the height of what it could be so far? I don't know. Is that even fair to ask? It's hard. <laughs> it's like, normally I don't struggle. I'm pretty good at being objective, I think. But this this generation of Pokemon in particular is really hard for me. Because to me, it is more than just this generation, you know, even if I could separate the experiences I've had around it, which were great um, and were really memorable to me, to me, there's more in all of them. There's more to a Pokemon generation than just the pillar games. Um, And this one had XD Gale of Darkness. It had the movies, which I thought were great. Um, And it also had Pokemon Channel, which I played way more than anybody you'd think would play Pokemon Channel. (laughs) <laughs> um it also had uh like i said that web comic i read so there's just all these other things that go along with this era for me that it's like hard for me to separate all those out exactly do you do, just i'm curious do you know what pokemon channel is <laughs> i don't <laughs> okay do you know hey you pikachu Yes, I we did talk about that in our Golden Sun episode, so I know yeah, a little about that. I, I thought we did. Um, I want you to imagine, hey, you Pikachu, except a Pikachu comes to live with you at your house, and all you do with him is watch TV. <laughs> so you were watching TV with a Pikachu? Yeah, but they're all like Pokemon shows, and Pokemon host the shows. So okay. there's like Boba Fett's Trivia Night, and like things like this. Are you sure this isn't for the Satella view? <laughs> I mean, it kind of would have made sense. <laughs> but uh yeah, I don't know why I was so enamored with Pokemon Channel, but I just thought it was neat. Um and it's just another thing that goes along with this whole era for me. It's I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's pro it's Probably between Gen 1, Gen 3, and Gen 4. Ooh, no love for Gen 2, huh? I didn't have those back then, so oh. I just don't have those <laughs> memories. <laughs> um, I think Gen 2 is awesome. We need to go back, back and plant the memories. <laughs> I, I do need to, because um, I just don't have much uh, experience with Gen 2. Um, yeah, and I have great memories with like all the Pokemon games, but I think that those three are just the ones that I have the best memories of, and I do think that that is part of it for me, um, for Pokemon specifically. Mm-hmm. I think something that 
has even just sort of come out while we've been talking about it. Gen 3 is feels extra special because even just talking to you about it now, like there's a bunch of things I didn't even know about it when I was playing through it. So now like it makes me want to go back and like find like Deoxys and like get all these other things that were there that I just missed. Yeah, because you really like that in games where you feel like there's still more potential, and more things to find. Yes. I, yeah. I still believe that there's all kinds of little things in games that nobody has found. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that back then I got that same feeling from Gen 3. Because like I said, the Shedinja especially, it was like, you mean a Pokemon can, one Pokemon can evolve into two Pokemon? Anything is possible. Yeah. <laughs> like all the rules are off. All bets are off. We can do anything. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's always fun to, to find that missing thing or feel like you're the first person to find something, even though in, in our world now it's borderline impossible. Yeah. But I do always with friends. Um, I try to not look too much at the up and coming Pokemon. I look at the starters when they leak, uh, inevitably. Um, and maybe I'll look at a couple of them just to get hyped. But after that, I, I'm kind of good. I, I'm ready to just go into it myself, not knowing too much, and just see what I find. Um, and then even if you know, you're know you not the first in the world, I can kind of replicate that just in my circles with friends um, that will be the first to, you know, someone will be the first to find various things and I, I think that that's still a really fun experience that you can if you set rules for yourself you can still have another thing and this is like a smaller thing was the introduction of the running shoes is life-changing oh my gosh life cha like night and day difference like amazing you you youngins <laughs> out there <laughs> don't remember the days where you had to walk everywhere but like yeah. Oh my gosh, before Gen 3, you actually had to walk everywhere. That yes. was it. You could you could get a bike, but that came way later in the game. And then you couldn't use the bike in that many areas, too. You could use it outside, <laughs> and that was it. Yep. Um, and frequently, there'd be terrain and stuff you'd have to get off for. Yeah, the running shoes just made a world of difference. And you couldn't run inside. You can do that now. And that's such one of those weird Nintendo things. Like, why can you not run inside? And I'm sure that the answer is like, well, because it's rude or something. But it's like, it's a game. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. It almost feels like, and this is like, gonna date, date us probably, sound like horribly pathetic. But I feel like my parents were always like, I had to walk to school when I was younger. And it's like, well, I had to walk. Like, from one Pokemon gym to the next. <laughs> mm. I, I actually did walk to school in elementary and middle school, so I can't say too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would have walked. I was homeschooled, so I guess I technically walked to school as well. Mm, I'd be much more interested if you took a bike. It, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was more of a flight of stairs, but still. Yeah, I, that, that's I, why the bike would be interesting. <laughs> I, I did it. I broke a sweat both ways, but... I did it. That made me who I am today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it makes you if it makes you feel it, people out there feel better that I got to walk to school, maybe that's something you wanted to do. Before I got to do that, um, for elementary school, I ended up living in a city and then going to school in a different city. So I actually took a bus a really long way. I don't totally know why I did that either. That's something I probably should ask my parents. Like, why Why was it that way? But then also for high school, um, I went to an, a high school that was out of our, our uh, I don't know what you call it for. Oh, uh, out of our zone, out of our zoning restriction. So, um, yeah, I had to drive decently far to go to that too, so. The years where I have fond memories of when getting to walk <laughs> when school was actually close. <laughs> but my dad taught at the high school, so that's why I got to go to that one. He was the band director, so he was my teacher for four years. Because <laughs> you said you play the bassoon, right? 
I do, and I played Baritone as well. Because okay. bassoons didn't, don't march, so I had to pick something else. Gotcha. And they told me I didn't have to learn something else, you just had to hold it, but I was like, that's really lame. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to just hold an instrument for half, you know, the first half of the year. That sounds really bad. This is going to be like a very random tangent. And then we'll get back to Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald. But when I started high school, I I didn't know how to play an instrument, but they said I could join the band and they would teach me how to play the drums, which I was interested in at the time. And on the first day of band class, the teacher made us go around and say what instrument we played. And I had to say, I don't play anything, but I want to, but I was told I could learn the drums. And mm-hmm. he's like, well, we don't have any drums for you, but I'll give you a French horn so you can play that. And it was like so weird and embarrassing. I can imagine. And so I ended up just dropping the class oh. <laughs> and I I never learned the drums. Oh, but how that relates to Pokemon and Ruby version. Not sure, but uh, I'll, I'll bring us back to it. All right. Take um, us, take us back. <laughs> so another random thing I like to me, gen three, I, I looked it up to make sure. And, uh, it's the last one that other than I guess four. Yeah. Four, four, I, I, I guess I'll count four. So maybe it's not the last one, but it it feels like the gemstones hit their peak here. I'll say that, which maybe you, like you don't even know what I mean. But um, I'm talking about like we had silver and gold and crystal, and I'm still like not entirely sure how Suicune is Crystal's flagship Pokemon. Like that's really weird to me. Um, and I haven't played Crystal, so maybe it makes more sense if I do. But I just don't. Like, Suicune is the weirdest one to me that's ever made it to the cover of a game. Because he just doesn't feel like he's that kind of Pokemon. Mm-hmm. I would because I understand. Yeah, there's three of them. There's three of the legendary dogs. And so it would be like having Moltres on a cover. It's like, why? <laughs> um, But then we get Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. And I'm like, yeah, each of those... And it might be because it's of the Pokemon versions... But each of those gemstones evokes a very strong color for me. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really think the coloring never got better than this. Because, yeah, there's red, blue, and green. But, like, and obviously this is paralleling that. But, I don't know, ruby, sapphire, and emerald just sounds fancy. I don't don't know. Classy. And then, you you know, you get a diamond, pearl, platinum. And I'm like, okay, diamond kind of fits with crystal. Pearl, I know it counts as like a gemstone, but because it comes from clams, it's a little bit weird for me. And then platinum is like this super uh, high profile metal more than the others that I'm just like, yeah, okay, that feels a little bit weird. Um, But I guess it fits with silver and gold count. Mm -hmm. But to me, it would make more sense to do silver, gold and platinum. Yeah. But whatever. It sort of um, just means we're on pace for Pokemon rubber, Pokemon aluminum foil, and Pokemon um, styrofoam. Yeah, but that's sort of the thing. After that, we didn't get any more gemstones, and I'm just now noticing that. We got heart gold and soul silver, and then we get black, white, black and white two, X and Y, Omega Ruby and Omega or an Alpha Sapphire. But I mean, that's just Ruby and Sapphire again. Mm hmm. Uh, Sun. Uh, I didn't say sun and moon, but sun and moon. Um, and now sword and shield. Like, I don't, I don't know. It was just weird that like the, to me, this is like when the naming convention kind of hit its peak, I think. Um, is that really something that matters too much? No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's just, it, it's just interesting. I think. Yeah. How they decided to name them is interesting. Like who, who in their right mind would ever have thought that there would be a Pokemon black and white? Mm. Yeah, can we... Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> so, um, this is sort of an inside joke for the podcast because um, in one of our first episodes, it may have been our first Pokemon episode when we talked um, red and blue and yellow. 
It was either that or it was top uh, our top RPGs list, our very first episode. Uh, yeah, it could have been. Um, there's a segment where I'm talking about how it's how Pokemon black and white don't exist. And then Alex is like, yes, they do. Yeah, I think your exact words were like, Pokemon has always stayed true to its roots or something. And I was like, I'll elaborate. And uh, he he cut this, but I really wanted it to stay in. (laughs) Um, And he says like, uh, well, there's never been like Pokemon black. And I'm like, uh, that would be Gen 5. And he's like, what? (laughs) And then he, I forget what you said. It was like, there's never been, okay, there's never been, along the same line of thinking, there's never been, like, Pokemon Edge of Darkness. And I was like, uh, do you mean Gale of Darkness? And he goes, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he was being completely serious, and it is one of my favorite moments that I wish had stayed in. So I'm glad that we're talking about it now in the season finale. Yes, the the season finale, you have to you have to reveal the how factually unknowledgeable i am oh, Al- was... alex is the brains of the game of all the games that we talk about <laughs> um i forgot one though too i just saw like i had my list of pokemon versions up for those names and i totally forgot another really big experience i had with this game and that was um pokemon mystery dungeon started with with this game and i read that manga in like a weekly release um in nintendo power and uh, did you play the Mystery Dungeon games at all? I didn't. And I, I never got Nintendo Power, but everyone who got it is like always so infatuated and like thrilled with it that I feel like I, I missed out on something really special. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it, it was pretty <laughs> special. It was just cool because, you know, that catalog you talked about earlier. Yep. It, it was essentially that on like steroids, I think. It sounds like it. From um, thing I've heard about it. But yeah, every month they in the build up to the mystery dungeon games, they sent out uh, like a couple more pages of the manga. And then if you at the end of it, you had all the pages of the manga and it was a pretty decent story um, about a little kid who wake goes to sleep and then wakes up as a Pokemon. And it was it was just a cute little story, but uh and I think they did also an anime one-off of Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. And the Pokemon, like, talk to each other, and like, actual English, which was super different, and there's no humans in that world. So hmm. it was just really cool to see a different take, and now we see Mystery Dungeon has gone pretty far. Uh, but it, it put you in direct control of the Pokemon. You got to play directly as them. And that was another thing that was just super cool. Um, Mm -hmm. And I had a Red Rescue Team because that was the Game Boy Advance one. And I didn't have a DS yet, but my brother did. And he got Blue Rescue Team. And so we played those together and it was just a ton of fun. And that's another thing that I it's another thing that it's like, is this my favorite era of Pokemon games? And I'm like, I, I don't know. That definitely would sway me to yes as well, though. That just such good memories with uh, the original Mystery Dungeon games, and th- those were just really stellar games. And a-, a very quick aside, I did later try to get uh, back into Mystery Dungeon, and I remember being really disappointed with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna glance it. I need a list to see which one I tried. I think I ended up picking up, um, so I'm an adult now, obviously, and I picked up Mystery Dungeon Gates to Infinity, I think it was. And the thing that killed me about it was that um, the text speed was super slow, and there was no way to increase it. And then the games are not the easiest always, which I I appreciate. Um, I do want to struggle a little bit. But um, I ended up struggling at like one boss fight in Gates to Infinity, and the cutscene before the boss fight was really long, and so the text would I'd have to scroll through like a mountain of text that I couldn't speed up 
beforehand <laughs> oh. to even retry it. And I know that like people relate because that's just an RPG thing that happens sometimes. But man, it is frustrating. <laughs> uh, but I, I plan on... Uh, I'm trying to not let that sour me on the whole series. And I'll probably try another one at some point. Um, I think maybe I should go backwards, though. Because the ones after the ones I played, Red and Blue Rescue Team, um, are Explorers of Time and Explorers of Darkness. And then I think they had like a third edition, Explorers of Sky. So maybe maybe I should give those a try um, and see if they're a little bit better. Or maybe Super Mystery Dungeon, it looks like, is another one. Um, I, I, I don't follow this series quite as well as the mainline games, but I'm glad it's still going strong and definitely would be willing to check it out again. Sure. I actually hadn't heard of that one at all, so I'll have to check it out for the first time. Uh, oh, it looks like they, like I said, I just don't know these. It looks like they did put out a Switch one called Rescue Team DX, um, which mm -hmm. might even be a remaster of the originals. So that might be a good one for us to play at some point. Uh, I don't know that I have too much more about Pokemon Gen 3. A um, lot of great uh, memories, as, as I said. Um, Pokemon, to me, still, like, there weren't that many of them. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm always happy. Like, Pokemon is something I'm like, the more the merrier. Same with a lot of other games that are very character-focused like that. But everybody sort of knew all of them back then and that was really nice oh i did have one other sorry i keep thinking of other things just another weird thing i had during this time um i got through a scholastic book fair um right before the games came out i got a guide and maybe some of you out there had the same guide i think i probably still got it because like i said i keep gaming related stuff um, so this guide had all these Pokemon in it. Um, but the guide was based on like, I don't even know what, um, I guess like an earlier build of the game somebody got and a bunch of the stuff in it was just wrong. <sighs> so I remember being really confused because I, tr when I eventually got the games, um, which came way later, I tried to go by the guide and like I said, none of it was right or some of it was. A lot of it was. But some of the weird things in it were like Ralts. It's weird. It, yeah, it just went Curlia to Gardevoir. They they got that wrong. And then Trapinch did not evolve into... I forget what the middle one is. And then the middle one just evolved into Flygon. So going into the game, it, when I had this guide, I was like, ah, I need to go find that middle thing. Vibrava. That's what it's called. Yeah. And then I... So I could never find Vibrava and was like, well, what on earth is this and then Shedinja didn't come from anything Shedinja <laughs> was just by himself too so it was like yep go find Shedinja but I, I sort of like those catalogs I just had this weird messed up version of all these Pokemon to look at before I had the game so I was definitely anticipating it more than uh, more than normal well how about we wrap it up there yeah, uh, definitely, if you haven't played the Hoenn ones, um, definitely pick those up. Even if you're not big into Pokemon, I think maybe that could be a good one for you. Because um, the story point. is good. The Pokemon are d all designed fairly decently. Um, there's some, like we said, that are not as good, but... Very, very few. Yeah, and it's just a great... Like, all the games around it are pretty fun. And so, all the internal elements and extras are also worth checking out yeah definitely just a really nostalgic game and um the the uh, i have uh, this whole time just for the sound i've had a long play going in the background um and the whole thing it seems like they know exactly what to do and it's 12 hours 15 minutes so if you're a very accomplished gamer i guess and you're it's your first time uh you you can probably do it in like 20 something hours it's not None of the Pokemon games are that huge of a commitment. If you're a veteran, you can go back and Nuzlocke it. Do you know what Nuzlocking is? I'm curious. Nuzlocke is a Pokemon, right? Um, what do you mean by veteran? 
<laughs> so a Nuzlocke, <laughs> it might be a Pokemon. It might be that middle one for Shiftry. I don't remember how Nuzlocking got its name. But uh, I, I figured this would be a weird factoid that Daniel wouldn't know. Um, but I, I think this kind of got its start with Gen 3 as well. So I think it has to be mentioned. Um, Nuzlocking is a way to play the games that uh, more experienced players use to challenge themselves. So the way it works is you it's basically house ruling it to make it hard. Mm -hmm. So you can only catch the first Pokemon in an area that you find. And then if one of your Pokemon faints, it dies and you must release it. Ooh, permadeath. <laughs> yes, which I know you like. <laughs> Love it. Um, so yeah, the, the main thing is just playing Pokemon with permadeath. And a lot of people have very good... Um, some really great stories with that. Uh, one one that comes to mind is the YouTube channel Jaden Animations. If you if you want to go watch her animations of a, uh, she she's animated her Nuzlocke attempts for Gen three, and those end up with really cool stories. But okay, now now I'm ready to actually leave it there. I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as Daniel was saying, that brings us to the end of season one. <laughs> That is the end of season one. Thank you for everybody tuning in for our 12 episodes. Um, we hope to be back for season two. Um, if you want to keep continuing to check out our other episodes, that would be great. Uh, you can message me on Twitter at Magar Mentions, or you can message us through the turn by at turn by turn podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, if you'd rate and subscribe on either YouTube or Apple podcasts, that'd be greatly appreciated, but we are available everywhere for sure. And just thank you guys for checking us out. Um, not to get too sentimental already because it's still kind of a new show, but I've, uh, I've done kind of podcasty things before, and this is definitely the one that I've enjoyed the most. Um, it's just been a lot of fun to do. Um, I enjoy hanging out with you guys and Daniel every other week. And uh, it's it's just been a lot of fun. So I really hope we can keep doing it. And I hope you guys keep enjoying it. Our, our season one will roughly be, or the rough draft title of season one will be the Game Boy Advance year. Because <laughs> we, we talked about a healthy amount of Game Boy Advance games this time around. Yep. But. And expect more of that too. Don't don't think we're going to be done with it, but there's going to be a lot of other stuff too. Yeah, you can't escape the Game Boy Advance that easily when you have two people that grew up playing playing it almost nonstop. <laughs> yeah, but we're gonna, we're going to get into some newer games, um, and maybe even older than we have, uh, and just lots lots of weird stuff because that's that's the fun, you know. There's like always we, more. So tell of you content to be had. I was literally going to say that maybe we'll <laughs> we'll do a so tell of you thing and then we'll be the only podcast that uh, reviews the so tell of you games or something like. Yes. <laughs> unless there's one other out, out there already or something. And then shout out to, to those guys, whoever they are. <laughs> we'll, we'll find them and collaborate with them for an episode. <laughs> oh, that'd be that'd be great. Watch, watch them be like total purists like. Um, actually the satellite is still up there and you have to set up your own satellite in the backyard to get the signal <laughs> and yeah, you, you have to camp out and use your, your satellite to, or you have to drive out to the deserts of New Mexico to use the giant satellite out there to, cause the signal's gotten a little weaker, but <laughs> well, if that's the case, we will definitely be back to talk about it. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye.